welcome everyone. We'll, we'll make this the kind of official kickoff. Um, but basically, uh, this is a, a What If event, which is uh, organized by uh, Unbox um, Festivals. And so the idea of this format, right, is to uh, bring together diverse groups of practitioners around one uh, a specific topic uh, to be able to kind of imagine the future, what the future holds uh, for us, and, and what are some of the existing kind of signs, emerging signs of that uh, today, right? So as I was saying, the, the what if is a is a format that uh, we've been running a, a few times now. This is our third edition. Uh, this is a collaboration between Unbox, uh, Futures, Cultural Futures Society, and Space Ten originally. So this was meant to be held uh, the 14th of March at the Space Ten space in in Tanmel, Delhi. Because of the current situation, we've uh, had to kind of follow the general trend of, of turning this, uh, reworking this into a webinar. But just to give you a little bit of context before we start about ourselves, uh, Unbox Cultural Future Society, we're, uh, we've been created by Quicksand, and uh, Quicksand has been uh, experimenting with its own kind of uh, arts-related format since 2005. Uh, but in 2011, the first kind of formal uh, format of Unbox emerged, uh, and since then, uh, Unbox Lab, I Miss, uh, Arts Festival, Future Picture, or just to name a few, are some of the kind of offshoots of that uh, format. Right? Uh, before we start, just a, a couple of pointers uh, I wanted to share. Sorry, on before moving on, uh, on Unbox, the, the the main purpose, right, of this platform is, uh, is to do a couple of things, but uh, namely to kind of create experiences, collaborative experiences, where we work with practitioners around uh, from our, our kind of global network to uh, put on these unique uh, shows and performances, to, which engage the audience through these kind of uh, uh, unique, but also kind of very personal uh, interpretation of uh, different topics. Um, and because of that platform and because of the history we've been able to kind of create for ourselves, seed new collaborations. So before we begin, just a, a couple of things I wanted to share with the audience. Uh, one, the session uh, is being recorded, and so we'll, we'll uh, share that on our platforms in a little bit. Um, if you'd like to ask questions, uh, please drop them in the Q&A. Uh, there should be a, a kind of questions tab that's available for you to uh, write in those uh, questions. If they're pointed as a, at a specific speaker, uh, please call out their name so I know who to address them to. Um, and we've spoken to the speaker, uh, and uh, they're okay with any of you wanting to take screenshots. Uh, and if you'd like to kind of hear more or reach out, I, I'd put the kind of contact information at the end of the day. So before we begin, if we are to speak of the of the future of crafts, I've, I've put a kind of quick slide to, to help us frame the discussion, right? And it can be a little bit challenging to, to define uh, such a big space, but what we've tried to do is kind of create a loose definition for ourselves uh, that is mostly seeing crafts as objects that are made by individual uh, and tell a story, right? And this is kind of a, a highly synthesized, highly kind of abstracted version of uh, a definition that the uh, UNESCO uh, came up with in uh, 1997 on uh, during the craft and uh, international market symposium and two two bits in that definition that uh, I thought I'd call out especially for the purposes of today uh, was that defining aspects of craft are the the idea that there's a manual contribution from an artisan right so there's a, a direct relationship with the human with the hand uh, with the creation uh, even if that is uh, kind of uh, navigated by or, or facilitated by a tool, right? And the other aspect we really want to focus on today is the kind of uh, social meaning and symbolism and significance uh, and, and how uh, crafts can be used as a vessel to kind of tell stories, right? So uh, to kick this off, right, the, the way we've structured this discussion, and I hope this will emerge from, from the talk, uh, is to look at three different kind of pillars of crafts, right? And so one to us, uh, a kind of core component we wanted to be able to call attention to is this idea that crafts are a, a means of telling uh, stories from a diverse range of perspectives and, and give a voice and give a platform for uh, people who may not otherwise be able to, to, to have it, right? 
there's also this idea of, uh, of a kind of utilitarian history to craft, right? In making, um, making started through this kind of practical problem solving uh, and being able to, to make as a way to engage with your environment and, and build upon your environment, right? And so this idea of problem solving is, a, is another kind of key pillar. And the final one uh, is this idea that uh, crafts is a constant experimentation. It might mean new intents, new stories, new tools, new mediums. Um, and so that's the kind of third pillar we really wanted to capture with our uh, panel. So I'm going to uh, stop speaking uh, and uh, give it over to our, our first speaker. So we have Sumeda Garg and Nitin Batla. I'm, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing it too, uh, not too inaccurately. But uh, Sumeda and Nitin, Nitin are uh, co-founders of Other Worlds. Uh, a practice through which they explore the relationships between traditional knowledge systems, place making, and people. Um, these are a lot of words I've condensed into one sentence, but I'll let them uh, kind of take over and uh, explain what they do. Over to you. Can you see my screen now? Can I share my screen? Now? No, so I will be sharing from my screen, and I'll, I'll click through the slides for you. Okay, and should we ask you to uh, move to the next slide, or yes. how do we do it? Exactly. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, so, no, could you go back to the slide, the previous slide? Yeah. So I think there's a little bit of lag. Uh, so I'm on the Studio Other Worlds kind of uh, uh, main page. Yeah. Yeah. So um, all right. Um, so I just um, maybe I start and uh, with Sumeda. Uh, thanks for coming out today. I can see the 68 people who joined in, and uh, it's a Saturday, so thank you. Uh, the, the slide that we have. Um, as a starter, as 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 a head slide here, is actually uh, something we'll talk about later. But um, it's sort of it's it's something that was sent by one of the women we work with, um, uh, who's a migrant in one of these places from where these really horrible horrible photographs have been emerging. And what this slide or what this sort of photograph. Um, tries to present or tries to talk about is another aspect or another reflection on this current crisis. So she's um, drawing uh, one of her neighbors who's caught COVID and uh, the fight of um, the family that shares a 12 square, square meter living space, uh, trying to self-isolate within this space. So it's it's sort of her reflection on on, on this, but we'll talk about this later. But uh, maybe Sumeda and I start with introducing ourselves. Um, we wanted to not talk about us too much, but rather how we came together. So uh, Sumeda and I, um, we moved to, uh, so, so I moved to back to Delhi in 2013 after finishing my master's in Zurich. And I am, I am an architect and urban, urban researcher. And, uh, what I had been interested in and practicing a little bit is uh, social design and um, practicing with communities or researching with communities. And um, Sumeda and I, we encountered each other through uh, an exhibition where Sumeda was exhibiting in 2015, and that was the start of our partnership. Um, Sumeda, maybe you do want to add a little bit? Yeah. And I think uh, for me, similarly, I've been um, using art and education as um, tools in a way to practice in the more socially engaged social design sphere and also exploring um, art, craft, um, indigenous knowledge systems in um, communities in India. I spent some time also doing the same thing in South Africa and it's when me and Nitin, um, we've been talking about overlaps, you know, where is art, architecture, um, looking at people, places, and stories, how do those overlap? And that's when we started collaborating together. 
So um, in 2017, I moved back to end of 2017. I moved back to Zurich uh, for doing my PhD. But um, yeah, and uh, Hugo, could you maybe shift to the next slide? Uh, so um, it was in 2019, really, when I had moved to India for a year for my field research. That. Um, Serendipitously, this this uh, proposal from Coach came up uh, for socially engaged art projects around uh, along peri-urban areas in India, and I I saw it, it saw I, I looked at it and I felt brilliant like you know this is a great way to actually not research about communities but actually research with communities you know so I called up Sumedha who serendipitously had also moved to India at that that time. Uh, and we decided to apply for this project together. And uh, luckily, Coach um, shortlisted or chose us as one of the four projects that they funded in that year across India. And um, yeah, and that's how this particular project of Studio Other Worlds began. Um, maybe could you move to the next slide, Hugo? So um, the idea here was a little bit. Uh, it was emerging out of my PhD. Um, so what I was looking at is a Delhi without borders, um, a Delhi beyond the borders, and which is sort of being produced relationally. Um, uh, could you move to the next slide? So um, how to think about this uh, massive urban production relationally? You know, how how to think um, this transformation of, of this agrarian rural landscape? In, in in the region in relation to what's happening in, in Delhi. And um, yeah, could you move to the next slide? So yeah, so, so the idea, I mean, what I was looking at is what I call tenement towns and the congruent inequalities. So I was looking at these manufacturing clusters in the region of Delhi and the villages around them that have somehow emerged um, as a housing solution to them. So places where migrants are housed and of, often in very uh, coercive and violent environments. Um, so I was looking at uh, the villages around Udyog Vihar, which is on the border of Delhi and Gurgaon, um, IMT Manisar and in Bivadi. Um, so this particular one, which we chose to work in, Kapaseda, uh, could you go to the next slide, Hugo? Um, is we chose this one firstly because it was um, somehow uh, accessible to both Sumeda and I to establish our presence in this community. In so um, Sumeda lives in Gurgaon and I live almost on the edge of Delhi, so it was somehow also accessible to us. So Hugo, maybe could you go back to this slide, previous slide? Okay, so uh, quickly, if I could explain where Kapazera is located, this is uh, Delhi's green belt. And um, uh, within it, uh, this really dense um, village over here is Kapazera. And it uh, has almost 300,000 people, uh, 300,000 migrants from UP and Bihar who live there. And they work in this um, big industrial area close to it. And this is Kapaset, of course, is not the only tenement town that emerges in relationship with Deog Bihar, but there are um, other ones close by Samalka, uh, Samli, uh, Dundahira, and all that. But uh, Kapaset is the biggest one. And um, that's so we, we started to uh, work there. Could you go to the next slide? So the specific problematic in, in Kapaseda was, um, okay, I mean, there is the labor, exploitation of labor, but also of rent, for rent. Um, so, I mean, you have um, right next door these big farmhouses from the landlords who, who actually own land in Kapaseda and who are running with the Ogvihar, basically. Um, and you have uh, really, really dense, I mean, if you go to Kapaseda, it's denser than Old Delhi. Um, and it's on the periphery. Right? So it's it's just to give you an idea. 
so um, these tenement blocks um, which um, uh, sort of occur in Kapasila, these are also um, architectures of, of, of exploitation or of um, surveillance or uh, also uh, some architectures through which this patriarchy um, of this landowning Yadav community in Kapaseda operates through. So our idea through this intervention, Sumedha and I, we wanted to challenge this patriarchy, but not uh, outrightly, but uh, slowly embed ourselves and um, reflect with the migrants there. So sort of practice with the migrants and reflect on uh, firstly the production. Um, so these are garment manufacturing uh, uh, laborers um, who work in garment manufacturing units. So first think of the planetary chain of uh, fast fashion. And secondly, of the land itself, you know, and, and, and the class dynamics in Kapaseda. So if you go to, go to the next one. So this is uh, basically how the transformation happens in Kapaseda. Uh, from being an agrarian land, plot of land, to becoming something of a what is called a Karkat colony, and then becoming a six-story um, concrete typology in which almost 150 migrants live crammed up. Um, could you go to the next one? Uh, Uh, so yeah, these are a few images of how it looks like, and this is also um, from a space that we finally decided to work out of. Okay, could you go to the next one? So this is how a concrete colony finally looks. Finally, looks like um, next. Um, yeah, these are. Uh, these are how the rooms are. So they are between 10 to 12 square meters. Um, could you go to the next one, Hugo? Mm -hmm. And this is how, um, uh, so this is the cadastral ag agrarian map of Kapaseda. Um, and this is how um, through uh, sort of negotiations between the landowning classes of Kapaseda, the, the Yadavs uh, namely, uh, the transformations and plotting of these tenements happens in Kapasila. So this 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 map almost becomes like a master plan. So Sumedha, would you take over this, this section? Yeah. So um, to start, we we Nitin had already spent a lot of time in Kapasila, and what I started doing was going through these walks in Kavasira to start understanding people's relationships to each other, to the space, um, and started collecting stories in Kavasira. So lots and lots of conversations happened. Um, some of the things that started emerging from these walks and conversations were that um, there were no um, safe spaces for women. It's, it's such a patriarchal um, community that there weren't spaces for women to meet um and also it's so dense and there weren't spaces for children to play and definitely there was um no sense of art or coming together to create something um that only sort of happened so this is an image of the production unit so a lot of um, Udyogi had, has sort of slowly, slowly seeped in in their smaller production units all over Kapaseda. Um, and there was a similar production unit that we chanced upon, um, which we decided to um, turn into a safe space uh, for the women, for the children to come together and start creating or making art and expressing themselves. and. Uh, Hugo, you can move forward. These are some images from the community. For instance, um, this image where you see the bricks, this is actually the colony that we work in. And um, the children had used these bricks to, to play a game because this is all the space that they have access to. So this is um, a game that they play called Mountain and River, where climbing on top of the 
bricks is where the mountain is and everything around it is the imaginary river. So also looking at how children played. This was um, children collecting the waste fabric from the production units and stitching these garments for their dolls. Um, and this, this waste garment is something that we decided to work with as a material because there was so much waste in the community. So slowly, um, once we started setting up the space um, and engaging with the children and the women, um, just through drawing and collecting their stories and understanding um, how they felt about where they lived, um, we got in touch with a local um, nonprofit that works with women and um, asked them to to sort of facilitate this conversation with um, with women in Capacera. And we spoke to them about the fact you go, you can go forward. Yeah. So this is, uh, I'm going to quickly come back to setting up the infrastructure. Nitin, do you want to talk about this? Yeah, so um, what happened while Sameda was having these conversations was um, the, the other community, even within it, there are some actors that are more progressive and want to help um, people in the community. Not everyone is very patriarchal or the same. So we got access to one of these uh, industries that was empty. And uh, um, so we, we decided to actually, on a very subsidized rate, rent it for a year as a safe space uh, through the art grant. Uh, so this is the space as we got it. And then, um, yeah, we just minimally painted it white and introduced some basic infrastructure to so that the community could come and just use it. And we left the key downstairs. Um, uh, so so Meda would go there uh, three or four times a week. And then the rest, if they wanted, they could access as well. So slowly, um a group of women started coming to this space and um, we started workshopping things like, you know, just drawing, what are your stories? And the first time that I asked them, you know, what's your story? They said, um, but why would you even want to know our story? Why is it important? And I think that's the first time I really realized that um, for these women being migrants in Capacera, they really don't feel they have um any significance or even the sense of identity it's defined by power dynamics by them being women by them being migrants and initially for them to start coming up with their own story or their own voice it took it took some time but they started um easing into it slowly and what we decided to do was really look at um using the waste and sort of replicating stitching circles from their villages. So when their sense of identity, where they sit together and they stitch, and, and that was something that they felt very comfortable with, is coming together, sitting together, and, and they started stitching their stories. And slowly, slowly, piece by piece, um, what was very interesting is the kind of reflections they had, the kind of memories they had of their villages, that, that the way they saw um, where they lived. For instance, in this piece, Manju has embroidered one of these colonies. And if you look at it, you see how she has represented the walls. It's like being closed in. Um, and a lot of what came up was about boundaries, was about um, segregation. Um, this is Biba, who has who has this dream of being on a on an airplane. So she goes on weekends to the airport, close to the airport, with her husband to look at the planes land and take off. So also very aspirational. And slowly, slowly, through this process, they started to find their voice. This is um, a piece by Vandana on Eve teasing that happens in Kapaseda and how women feel very unsafe even in the public spaces. So this is um, Panuna walking to buy vegetables um, on a normal day and a man sort of um, misbehaving with her. And then she coming together 
with another woman to um, collectivize and say something about it. So slowly these stories started coming up um, on segregation, on borders. This is the border of India and Bangladesh shown by Biba. Um, and it was very interesting um, to see what was happening because slowly they started coming together. They had an identity. They also started talking about um, things that they faced at home, domestic violence, how they felt unsafe. So it started becoming a space to express their voice, to heal, um, to also have ownership of um, what they were feeling and making. Um, these are some of the pieces. This is uh, Mamta uh, with her sister kind of reminiscing about being in a green field. Um, so a lot came up about ecology and the environment as well. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention was going back to the map that Nitin was talking about. What we decided to do was sort of hand over this map of Kapasira to the women and saying, well, this is now in your hands and what would you do or how would you start looking at Kapasera? And that's why these pieces started emerging that we eventually put together to create a map of Kapasera. Here you see the pieces coming together to create the map. Do you wanna... Yeah, and uh, it was also about, I mean, um, as an academic or as a as an outsider to describe uh, it as a problematic, no? Like, it's very easy to talk about labor relations or uh, patriarchy or whatever, and uh, these commodity chains and the problems with it, but to how to think about it with the communities, no? So here in this planetary map, we were uh, talking to them about, um, Okay, you know, where, where do you think the cotton that you, that the textile mills here use comes from? Or where does the yarn come from? Where, where does it go to? What, what's happening here? Like, so it was also um, a sort of um, way of co-producing knowledge or co-producing um, or thinking about these things. So here, for example, uh, Kapas Heda, the name itself comes from Kapas, which is cotton, no? um, the Sanskrit word for cotton. And here they are trying to think about how uh, this in, uh, Kapas Heda is entangled with, with the empire of cotton that sort of spans the world in a way. So it was also um, a relational thinking with, with, with the people from there. So uh, maybe, yeah, so this is a sea of commodities that they started to describe. And actually, I, I must admit, um, I mean, I, I think it, I should say that this has been mostly Sumeda's work. Um, uh, I've been more facilitating things that Sumeda <laughs> likes to do, <laughs> but um, mm -hmm. Sumeda has been the central actor in this, uh, the whole, whole stuff. It's, um, so here, here is how the, the thing comes up. Uh, and uh, this is again the, the map of Kapasira, but with all these interventions from the women and also their self portraits, if you can see very fine um, on that black road. Um, so it's them relating to where they're coming from to, to Kapasira, which is so dense in this black and white map, what you see. So yeah. It's, it's a story about, uh, this map is also about relation. Yeah. What, what really started happening through this process is, it was, it, was, it, it was participatory and collaborative to begin with. And then I think even for, for me, um, we step back as facilitators and let the space and let this act of making or creating together sort of be the container or the vessel for the women to come together, for their voices, for the stories. And this was their interpretation. And the women never saw themselves as artists or craftspeople. But slowly as this started coming together, they realized that this was something that they had made and they had created and they were the artists. So even that shift in identity, even that ownership of this is our map or piece or that they call it a chadar, like this is ours and we have made this. 
And slowly what started happening was we started taking this to different places in Kapasera and Delhi. And from becoming um, a tool or a vessel for their voices and their narratives, it also started becoming a platform to have these conversations and these dialogues and these interactions that wouldn't ordinarily happen. You know, they suddenly found themselves with this um, tapestry or this map in different parts of Delhi, in different parts of Kapasera explaining this as their artwork, talking about how they feel, their stories, to people they wouldn't ordinarily speak to. And um, so for as the craft went a lot beyond just the making of it, you know, just beyond even empowering their voices, it also led to um, this really beautiful interaction with people. And here is, um, children of Kapasera responding to the map, making their own drawings. And we invited people to look at the map, but also um, come up with their own stories that the women would sit and stitch live as part of the pop-ups. So this is um, one of the girls who's got inspired by the map and has drawn herself with all these ice cream cones. Okay. Yeah. One of the yeah, very also... interesting that happened in the pop-up was how the women started confronting or speaking to men in Kapasera about alcoholism, about domestic violence. So they almost started using this platform. And you can see in this image, um, there are men on one side and the South Sahelia sitting together and they're discussing. And, and right after this picture was taken, uh, two of the women started actually delivering this, um, very, very impassioned speech almost to the men about what they face as women in the community. And I feel like that is something they did because of this coming together, because of this peace that was behind them. Sorry, Nitin. Yeah, I mean, that photograph was from the Labor Square in Kapasera. And um, yeah, I mean, so uh, we would pop up at let's say lunch break no so uh, we had two trunks and we would just pop up decide to do a pop-up just spontaneously somewhere and yeah at the labor square the confrontation with men who had more stable jobs i think was quite interesting um yeah so uh, moving on uh, i think what what has started to happen now is that the women have taken their own voice as artists um they uh see themselves as artists or they see the novelty in the kind of craft that they are building you know it's it's not a craft for sustenance but actually a craft for critical action in the city you know so um here is a, a photograph with a friend of uh, sumeda who was visiting uh, who did a workshop together but um we are now doing some other tapestries with uh, ambedkar university trying having conversations with other civil society groups in Delhi who are reimagining the city in a way um, to get these women to express uh, themselves. Um, yeah. Sumeda, do you want to talk about we, we need to yeah, do we're almost, we're almost um, over with time, so I'm just going to quickly, so the we just recently started engaging with the women over using WhatsApp as a tool, and they have really been stitching pieces of their experience of the current crisis from home. And we can talk about this. And these are what they're facing as migrants um, right now. And it's quite beautiful how, and also really um, heartbreaking to see, you know, the representations that are coming and hearing their voices through this craft at the moment. Yeah, I think we should end now. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. A, uh, a reminder to anyone who's uh, joined during the uh, conversation, the presentation, we'll be uh, doing this round of 10, 15 minutes. This is also a chance for me to kind of remind the, the upcoming speakers also of the, the uh, timing. But we'll, we'll be yeah. uh, doing these talks and then opening up for Q&A, OK? So uh, please feel free to drop questions. So far, I have uh, kind of three uh, comments or hellos, but uh, you can also use the Q&A uh, tool to um, you know, ask questions if, if you have any. 
Okay, so next I, I'd like to uh, invite Sewell Jim to kind of uh, tell us a little bit about himself and his work. Uh, he's an entrepreneur and leadership co uh, coach who works with businesses, startups, and individuals on their strategy, uh, but also the co-founder of Insight Walk, uh, a not-for-profit organization for community women who, to empower and educate children using minimal resources. Uh, over to you, Sewell. Thanks, Hugo. Uh, so let's get quickly started with Insight Walk, what Insight Walk is all about. Uh, Insight Walk is based out of rural Kolhapur in Maharashtra, where we are currently working in six villages uh, in the form of a rural fellowship program. So the women that you see on the screen right now, uh, these are our six fellows representing six uh, displaced communities, six different villages from rural Kolhapur. And what they do is they go through an 18 months fellowship program, an 18 months journey, um, where they start working with kids who are first generation learners. Now, what's really interesting about these communities is a bunch of things. One, uh, the communities that these fellows work with are highly uh, gender sensitive, uh, full of alcoholism. Patriarchy is a big thing that plays out in our community. Uh, superstition is, is another big thing that uh, dominates the community. Um, and most importantly, the communities do not uh, kind of encourage women as decision makers or women as, you know, sole uh, person who would actually step out and do something different. Um, so in those communities, these women actually step in um, as fellows um, these women themselves are actually school dropouts. Uh, they themselves couldn't complete their own education. Uh, they work with these kids for 18 months in an after school intervention program, which is at the community level. Um, and what really happens here is interesting. Um, they integrate science, design, arts, and facilitate learning. Now, the best part about the entire process has been the women and the kids, they themselves design their fellowship program. So the curriculum is designed by the community, uh, by the parents, by the children, by the fellows. Uh, and, the community, and the entire curriculum revolves around solving problems using locally available resources, solving program with a lot of design and use of concepts of design and arts. Um, and one such example has been uh, a Solidarity Art Farm Museum. Can we move on to the next slide, please? Next slide. Next. So let me actually solidarity art for museum. Uh, in one of the villages, uh, a bunch of our kids were documenting their entire one year journey, uh, starting from January 2019 till December uh, 2019. And what they came up with was a space where kids can actually learn what they feel like learning instead of a curriculum being superimposed on them. Uh, let me give you context of Solidarity Art Farm Museum. So the kids that you see in the photo right now, these kids are from one of the villages where we actually do not have a technical space, a space where we could actually run our intervention program. So every day kids would either sit in open, space under the trees uh, outside the school out uh, just on the road sites uh, over the year what they realized was can we not build a learning space uh, beyond the four walls of the classroom and the space that you see right now on onto the screen is one of the solidarity art farm museums which serves as a learning tool for the kids what's interesting here is kids actually learn more than 10 to 12 life skills on a daily basis I mean, right from photography to journalism, uh, to arts, to block printing, to comic writing, to writing their own books, uh, to composing their own music, uh, to using embroidery as a means to express their uh, thoughts. So a bunch, a whole bunch of skills are actually taught by the fellows, by the community members, by the local artists, uh, by the parents, to the children. 
what's also interesting about solidarity art farm museum is the entire museum is actually built on the daily problems which kids and their parents encounter could we move on to the next slide please um so one of the problems that the kolapur as a district is facing and might possibly be facing at a larger extent in the next 5 to 7 years is a uh, Kolhapur is actually a very dominating district when it comes to sugarcane cultivation. There are acres of land under sugar sugarcane cultivation, and the problem with sugarcane cultivation is two: one, uh, almost for an acre of land, almost uh, around I think 18 to million liters of while cultivating just an acre of sugarcane. That's one. Second, just the nutrient quality of the soil. It's it's because the sugarcane is cultivated on an extensive basis the soil is actually losing its nutrient capacity when we posed this problem to our kids they actually went in the opposite direction and instead of kolapur being a mono cropping uh, district uh, our kids actually started cultivating more than 10 crops in the same field instead of sugarcane and they started with the concept of mixed farming Uh, what's interesting about the whole process is one the entire farming is organic second in the process when kids actually started cultivating more than 10 crops they also realized they need bunch of other things to support their farming that led to the birth of lot more innovation at the local level one being organic fertilizers um how kids actually also came up with the idea of organic fertilizers was they would actually observe insects growing and what kind of insect would withstand what kind of uh, organic uh, fertilizers which crops can then finally develop that's how they successfully rolled out this for an entire year uh, today we are at a stage where all our 50 families are actually supported by the organic farm that the kids are working on uh, can we move on to the next slide so these are the different crops that kids grow in sync uh, on a daily basis at our organic farm uh, can we move on to the next next while growing organic uh, crops kids also realized um, they also need to grow crops which could actually help them uh, make their own colors that's when they started also cultivating flowers in the community the crop that you see on the screen right now is wheat this is for the first time when kids actually started uh, uh growing wheat in the community you use the bitter gourd as well as uh, tomatoes um let's talk about the uh, photo that you see onto the screen so last year in the rainfall season kolhapur is also a belt which witnesses heavy rainfall especially in maharashtra um and that's when our kids realized that most of our crops were destroyed by heavy rainfall that's when they came up with this solution wherein kids actually designed umbrellas for crops uh the way humans use umbrellas for their protection kids came up with the idea why can't crops have their own umbrellas and the best part is the entire umbrellas the set of umbrellas were designed using trash uh, locally discarded materials uh, including cardboards etc can we move on to the next slide uh now what is really interesting with the umbrellas and the concept of mixed farming was this umbrellas were installed at certain angles so that when during heavy rainfall the water would be diverted to the nearby crops which would actually require more water so that's how kids actually started uh, experimenting with the umbrellas as well as with the water uh, into the mixed farming they actually did not stop here Ah, uh, Maharashtra is also famous for Ganpati festival, the ten-day festival that goes on to the into the entire state. Um, what was really challenging was looking at the scenario in rural India, especially in rural Maharashtra, where almost every colony, every lane would actually set up their own pandal and get their own Ganpati idols, uh, usually chemically made. that's when kids again came up with the idea of how do we start making organic colors or organ using organic soil to make um idol 
and for the first time in all the six villages where we were working kids actually encouraged instead of getting around 15 to 20 idols per village uh, just getting one single idol for every village um, and then the decoration associated with the ganpati idols entire decoration instead of using plastic or buying from the market kids actually upcycled waste materials waste papers discarded uh, cardboard sheets etc uh, the decoration that you see onto the screen, every child from the 50 families that we were working in one of the villages, um, they actually made it for their own families. And instead of on an average spending two to three thousand rupees every year, uh, they actually saved this two to three thousand rupees. Now, when we look at the entire village economy, uh, it makes a lot of difference. If we even calculate 50 families and saving two thousand rupees and not using plastic. Um, it actually comes down to almost a lakh rupees that they actually ended up saving. Uh, so that was one of the crafts that they actually rolled it out at the community level. And with the Kanpati festival, what really happened for the kids in the community was community started participating at the Solidarity Art Form Museum much more than the uh, what they saw in the initial days. And that's when uh, the whole space of dialogue came up, wherein farmers and agri laborers would actually talk about uh, real time challenges that they face in the fields, uh, challenges that the parents are facing while kids are uh, at the art farm museum, etc. And that's when a bunch of our kids who are really good at science and innovation actually came up with tools which farmers could actually use. On the left side of the photo, the torch that you see. Uh, is actually made out of waste uh, cold drink bottles. Now this torch is actually used by farmers while going and coming back to the field, especially when there are no street lights. On the right top corner that you see is a portable fan, which farmers, act, which parents actually use while working in the field. Uh, at the bottom, what you see is a vacuum cleaner, which kids actually design. Uh, which almost every household in the village that we work with now has a vacuum cleaner where they use this for cleaning. Uh, can we move on to the next slide? Another problem that was posed by local community to our kids uh, during the discussion was that of uh, make, using grass cutter machines. Now, um, in rural Maharashtra, the equipments that are still being used uh, by the farming communities are traditional ones. Um, plus, the equipments which are designed currently are one, either they are not affordable, uh, second, they are not designed to the needs of the rural communities. Um, that's when a bunch of our kids actually went and interviewed uh, farmers who are in their 70s and 80s right now, and the problem that they face while farming. Uh, and they came to two conclusions. One, there's a lot of bending and squatting involved in the farming. Second, the tools are actually not affordable. Uh, that's when our kids experimented with three different prototypes and finally came up with a prototype that you see on uh, onto the right side of the sickle. Uh, can we move on to the next slide? So this is the grass cutter which our kids finally came up with. Uh, and the interesting part about this grass cutter is it costs as much as 130 to 150 rupees. Uh, where the existing grass cutter machines uh, cost somewhere between 15,000 to 20,000 per machine. So the whole idea with uh, all of these experiments and all of these examples has been um, the solidarity art from museum that we have been running for almost a year now um, has been a space where actually kids not look at subjects as traditional form of learning, wherein we learn math, science, languages, etc but look at their surrounding and look at the opportunities that are available in the surrounding and integrate that with their learning processes. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's all about insight work and could discuss rest uh, during question answers. Thank you so much, uh, Suva. This was uh, very insightful and, 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 and compact. Um, so Thank you. So I'll uh, again invite the audience to uh, leave any questions they might have. We're reaching our final speaker, Sahaj Rahal. Um, so, so far I have a couple of questions that uh, we'll bring up at the end, uh, but please feel free to, to ask. Okay. So 
Uh, now I'll kind of uh, close this presentation, Hedge. Uh, as soon as I introduce you, we'll go to your website. Uh, but you are an artist working with a range of mediums to bring to life your own mythologies uh, that draw from various, various sources to create scenarios where these uh, indeterminate beings emerge from the cracks of our civilization. Good. So, um, uh, huh. so, like, do you want to just like kind of scroll? Oh, oh, yeah, you can just open that one only, the first one. So, uh, just the for like, you just click on the first image, now. Huh? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, this was a project that I did at uh, the Sun Wa Center in uh, Chinatown in Vancouver. Sorry. And um, so, essentially, what's happening is like the way I work is like I create, like, I look for stuff, like, you know. Detritus, whatever, like you just, like I do, do a lot of skip diving, get a lot of trash, and then start creating objects out of them, like uh, that kind of looks like creatures or uh, artifacts, like that is being left behind by this like uh, uh, fictional civilization that was kind of like you know existing in the cracks of our civilization, and then kind of like appears and reappears in these like different forms. Uh, so. Yeah, like, you know, I mean, uh, if you just like kind of pause on one of these images, like, uh, like, yeah, so here, for example, all of this is, uh, there's styrofoam in there, there's a uh, polyurethane, uh, you know, expanding kind of foam, uh, wood, plaster, cement, uh, blocks of, uh, I mean, yeah, blocks of like, uh, concrete sometimes, whatever I can literally get my hands on. Um, okay, now if you go back, like, just to the front page again, um yeah uh so yeah the second image like i mean the guy who's like right on the top if you just click on the, uh just go up you go yeah uh, the se the image on the right yeah yeah, yeah that one. so here like um while there was this like kind of uh civilization that's kind of expanding there's also this uh kind of book that's coming together while while it's building right and then I started, so it's this manuscript of this civilization. And uh, the, these, these images, these paintings that I'm making are kind of like a, a bestiary of, of the, uh, like of that civilization. So like, you know, the, each of them have like kind of weird sort of uh, stories around them that like, uh, which I mean, I kind of build, but at the same time, it's sort of this, this thing that I'm kind of building with the audience, like you know, uh, so everyone kind of brings their own subjectivities to it, and uh, and that's how the the story kind of evolves. Um, now, uh, yeah, and like you know, you can kind of keep going through these like later as well uh, on my side. Uh, Hugo, if you just go back uh, and um, kind of Hugo, just go back to the front page again. Now, sorry. Yeah, there's just a little bit of lag, so I'm. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Sorry. Okay. Good. So, uh, perfect. So, like now, if you click on, um, just like keep going down, and you'll see like this inverted pyramid. Um, um, <clears throat> no. Yeah, so if you just click on that one, um, and uh, so this was at the Kochi Biennial where, uh, so I created like around 800 sculptures. Uh, I was there for about a year, uh, and the whole idea here was to kind of like chart the origins of the civilization. So like in any kind of archeological site, the first thing that we find is uh, terracotta. So uh, like, you know, in this entire space, which kind of looks like a laboratory, uh, and this is how it was, like, you know, it's been, it's been like this since, like, there was a laboratory here at one point, like, in the 80s or something. Uh, I, I kind of filled it up with, like, these large kind of monumental sculptures and then, like, even smaller pieces. And uh, the whole idea here was also to kind of, okay, so while I was working, um, there were these films that were being shot over here as well, because this entire space is also used as a film set when the biennial isn't on. So, uh, 
every time there would be a film like you know a shooting i would uh, like after the shooting i would go and kind of bring in things from the film set and then kind of make these things out of it so it's almost like uh, like you know the after life of cinema kind of like bled into the space um and then essentially there's there's these multiple kind of like narratives that are like overlaying on top of each other uh, that kind of you know sort of invite the viewer to kind of uh, put together this um uh, uh these fragments like essentially uh by themselves so they they're kind of like toys that you can tell stories with um so okay so now there's this like narrative that's expanding through all the work and then uh, so recently started kind of working with uh, artificial intelligence and like you know video games um so like um, you go uh, if you uh, do you have the video i said you yep let me load it I'm just concerned yeah, there's sure. a little bit of uh, choppiness, so I'll try playing it. Uh, but you may okay. to, uh, kind of uh, help read between the lines and, and kind of comment on it. Yeah, sure. So, uh, so just essentially, like you know, I mean, these creatures that are kind of like and and strange totems and everything that that's there in the um, in the civilization that that's kind of like unpacking in all the work. i thought like, you know it's each piece kind of like adds to the story right so like what would happen if oh it's really choppy <laughs> okay uh, so uh, i mean I'll, i'll kind of put out a link to the program as well at some point on my website so um uh, you know you can kind of play with it at that point essentially what's happening here is like you have this like quad effect that uh, kind of like moves um or you go just you want to like pause it for a second <laughs> um uh so like what happens is like uh, there's this like creature that's kind of made up with like uh, there's multiple like scripts attached to all the limbs in the uh, in the form so like uh, and then they're kind of like working in a way that, like there's no hierarchy in the sense like each script kind of like acts on its own uh, and uh, uh, kind of holds this thing together right so essentially like a script kind of acts like a like you have these limbs and then a script would sort of act like the mind except that now each kind of limb has its own mind now what happens here is that uh, you um uh, have these like multiple scripts kind of like speaking not like almost on top of each other uh, and creating this motion and then there's like uh so essentially what you get is an entire chaos that's kind of like somehow keeps this thing together and then um, like if you just play it you go like you know i mean we see it as like i guess screenshots but um like you know kind of choppy screenshots but essentially what's happening what's going to happen next is that uh, there was that like purple creature that kind of walked past this one it's going to come back at some point uh, i think and uh, yeah and then they kind of like interact like you know so all these creatures start like interacting with each other like you see that like uh, coming into that down and uh yeah ha so <laughs> it, it they they kind of they hostile towards each other like you know and uh, so it toss this guy and then like you will try to like refigure what is up what is down because all of this is like uh simulated right like i mean that even gravity is simulated and like the the wind currents and like the clouds that you see all of it kind of driven by separate ai program and um, programs that are kind of just occurring at the same time okay now what happens is like and this i mean i don't know how to explain this but essentially what happens is uh you can speak to the program as well like you know so it picks up input from the microphone uh and or let's say on like your laptop or whatever and that kind of messes with the code so like each sort of object in the in the environment is like created to listen to like separate things so like the clouds the the kind of rays of sunlight uh, all are inter- like you know kind of looking at say pitch volume tempo like you know the kind of responding to different things in, uh, from like audio input and uh, then what happens is like they um, so you essentially kind of mess up mess with the code so uh while that's happening um and um, so you go there's no audio on your side right because there's audio in the clip as well yeah but i i don't think it's uh, coming through so i've stayed Playing. okay 
all right cool so uh, essentially what happens is there's this um, drone that the program generates okay and that drone kind of modulates based on these interactions within the program um and also like gets kind of more messed up or whatever based on the audio input that it's taking so it's almost like you could speak to this world that responds in this like procedurally generated drone uh yeah so that that's what the program's about um one of the reasons i'm interested in ai and like you know the kind of narratives that ai can tell uh, or like you know can because i see it as this like collaborator essentially uh so ai itself has this like uh, telos to it right like i mean uh, it's supposed to make our lives more efficient and like kind of um, uh, you know it'll kind of uh, give us the shortest route from here to say the shopping mall or whatever or like you know an algorithm will tell us like the best uh, partner for us or whatever um so it's kind of got this idea of efficiency and it's kind of goal driven in that sense and then i was thinking what happens when you kind of remove that like you know you don't have this like uh forward arrow kind of like you know make everything perfect kind of narrative attached to ai what are the stories uh, that it's capable of telling what are the uh, sort of narratives that it's capable of putting together uh that's one of the questions and uh, and then that that kind of like unfolded into this program uh and also like a couple more like you know i mean so there's another one on my website for juggernaut uh where you see this uh in fact we can kind of have a look at that as well i mean this you would you want to go back to my website so it's the i think it's the third image of me ah uh, yeah third so so okay, which one uh, like all the way on top like you'll see this like kind of polygonal landscape kind of thing uh yeah so just yeah that one Cool. So, uh, like you can see, there's a <laughs> there's a sentient version and a possessed version that you can download for Mac and PC and like you know play these. Uh, the sentient version. If you just go to the uh, the slideshow that's playing. Um, so what happens here is like uh, you have this like little blob, right? And it's sort of wandering this landscape. It starts picking up these kind of like pieces of architecture that is strewn about the landscape. It starts creating sculptures around itself. and each time you reset the program it uh, kind of creates new objects around itself uh, there's larger other creatures that are moving around in the uh, in the landscape that start kind of coming and interacting with it and like you know sometimes they'll dance sometimes they'll uh, again they become hostile towards each other uh, and and then the narrative kind of unfolds in like weird ways you know so there's that that's happening and then you can download this and you can even play it as a video game so the the possessed version is like the one that you get to play and then can you create sculptures in this like kind of landscape um and uh, the other ones like uh, where you where it kind of does its own thing so it kind of literally has its own mind and and kind of builds these things okay so now uh, how do you think about this huh? um so when the program kind of begins you have this like little blob and it starts picking these things up its mind kind of like expands you know with each object it picks up so it's almost like if you were to uh, grow another hand tomorrow like you know your your sort of conscious being would sort of comprehend the fact that it's got another arm and then kind of make sense of how to use that arm whatever you know um so it's almost like it, like your you know your mind kind of expands and like um it gets kind of metaphysical and boozy over there like you know but uh um those are the kind of ideas i'm interested in in building this narrative uh in in how do we see how do we comprehend like kind of non human intelligences like you know i mean especially now when we have this like kind of weird uh, uh <laughs> non human virus that kind of you know almost like affecting us on a planetary scale and all that um what are the yeah what what are the mythologies that that these non human kind of intelligences would be able to tell you know 
uh, that that's kind of what I'm interested in. Yeah, so with that, like, you know, we had kind of wrap up and uh, I'm on Instagram, Facebook, or like, you know, you can email me if you have questions, whatever, uh, if you played with the program and you want to send me screenshots, whatever, and, uh, or like, you know, tell me how badly I code or whatever, that's all cool. Uh, so, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Sahinj. Um, so, I think, uh, you know, I'll leave this on for a second. I'm, I'm trying to look through uh, the different questions. I think I'll try to get at least one per speaker um, and then uh, end with, uh, you know, giving everyone a chance to kind of uh, think through or, or share their understanding of what the, the future of craft might be uh, or how, uh, you know, these various trends uh, are affiliated or not to the practice of craft, right? Because I think uh, in organizing this session, we've kind of uh, said, you know, we'll, we'll avoid being too strict about that definition and instead kind of see different practices around making and, and uh, that, that could be affiliated to craft, but uh, we haven't opened up uh, to you guys either to kind of say how you felt about that term, that label, and that space. Right? So um, that'll be the second question. I'll, I'll briefly kind of look through some of the um, other questions from the participants. So uh, one was for the first two uh, speakers, so Other Worlds and Insight Walk. Uh, what are the ways possible to access financial support for the sustenance and longevity of such community projects? Who would like to go first? Um, maybe, maybe, I, maybe I go in, and yeah. with Sumida. Um, yeah, I mean that's a difficult that's the difficult bit about these uh, community projects. I mean, in our uh, case, what we realize is we we try to uh, initially start a livelihoods program um, where the women were making some sort of bags or products, but we quickly realized that it it was going in a um, very NGO kind of direction, um, and uh, we didn't like that. But what we started to do is to rather collaborate with um, academic institutions and um, civil society organizations, which have some sort of funds um, related to doing community engagement where the women became artists. So that was, I mean, that for, for now, before the COVID crisis was working partially. Um, yeah, so that was our solution to, to, to it. What would you uh, like to comment? I agree to uh, part of the thing where you mentioned, I think funding is a huge challenge, uh, especially in the rural communities as well. Um, I think what we have been able to explore over the last uh, one and a half, two years especially has been, uh, one, how do we start creating low cost affordable solutions? Uh, I think uh, also the kind of communities that we work with, especially with the displaced communities where they are not even farmers, they are like agri laborers. Um, uh, an interesting bit has been with the students uh, always wherein where we explore how would a low cost uh, solution look like? How would a solution using uh, locally available resources would look like? Uh, and how could we get to basics? I think uh, one of the things that we constantly keep uh, iterating in all our programs has been um, instead of looking for what's easily available or looking for what could be possible alternates, uh, can we get to ba basics and understand what would work best for our economy and what would work best for rural economy? Um, so I think yeah, uh, two quick things would be one is low cost solutions uh, using locally available resources. Um, and second is community models. I think uh, we have been exploring Solidarity Art Farm Museum as a community model, uh, especially like the 50 families that we are working with, none of them have a farming land. Uh, so it all together, it becomes extremely special wherein 50 families come together, 50 students come together and they rely on a community uh, model that supports their farming needs. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, so the next question I'd like to ask uh, Sahaj, uh, it's it's uh, about your what your trajectory has been uh, to come to this point with your AI experiments. So I'm guessing maybe a little bit about how you first got into uh, the idea of using AI, uh, and uh, little by little, how have you been able to say like this is a milestone, this is a piece I want to you know showcase, and here's another milestone that I, I can kind of present. Uh, oh, um, I mean, it's it's kind of like back and forth, like um, a lot, the the sort of trajectory has sort of, I mean, I kind of began as a sculptor. I mean, I still see myself as that, uh, and uh, like even AI is kind of sort of like an extension of like sculpture only. Like you know, it's sort of uh, getting AI to think with form. Um, so like literally the first thing I kind of thought was like, okay, what 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 like you know can i get like this computer to uh do what i do and then like you know i, I mean i won't need to like take naps all day or whatever um <laughs> no also kind of um uh the whole idea was to to yeah like uh, kind of break it up in that sense like um get uh so this this mythological sort of narrative and everything is also something that's uh, so it's a system that's being created, and that that kind of generates essentially, like you know, it kind of uh, generates the the kind of uh, larger sort of uh, framework for on which I then like you know, so I have this like one like kind of framework in place, and then I could more or less like play with uh, like look, you know, anything I find I could kind of think about how does this kind of uh, like what is the story that this thing tells, like you know. Uh, and it was the same thing with AI, like like what, what are the the kind of narratives that you can tell? Um, that that's kind of why I got interested in it in the first place. Uh, and uh, yeah, also the fact that like it's kind of like proliferating so much. Right? I mean, like we ourselves kind of play host to uh, so many algorithms at the same time. Like you know, uh, not just in terms of um that that kind of like almost govern the way our lives are there, you know, uh whether we're aware of it or not um like you know the the your feed kind of like informs like so much about who, who uh you know, kind of like how you would act or like you know your kind of reactions to things around uh and then i was thinking okay like i mean okay so there's this like kind of passive intake that's happening uh for me personally or whatever um uh, how do you kind of um um you know how do you kind of not like i mean become more like play some kind of active role in that that kind of that traffic or um was something i'm interested in yeah thank you so i think one more question before we open up to you know your interpretation to the idea of craft for um uh, inside block and and other worlds i think i'm, I'm merging a few questions here for those who are uh, listening in but um, there's this idea about the, the reception from the communities, right? Uh, and so one is what kind of pushback has there been, if at all? Um, and the other one is how do you kind of sustain a momentum, uh, you know, in, in kind of introducing these new formats and then be able to kind of keep going with them? So uh, maybe Subodh, if you can kind of speak first. Pushback, definitely, yes. Uh, especially when you break a conventional pattern, there's definitely a pushback. Uh, and uh, it's it's there. How we look at pushback, especially uh, at Insight Work, has been there's always a threshold uh, we need to maintain and we need to gain the momentum till that threshold. Um, uh, with our uh, fellowship models, with our uh, women fellows, what we have experienced was uh, especially first eight to 12 months of their journey has always been all about pushbacks and a uh, uh, lot of challenges uh, most of them are usually uh, community created challenges um, but the moment you start involving people i think that's the key uh, not being into isolation not getting into a space where you're just uh, working with only one set of stakeholders or primary set of st stakeholders um, in our case, uh, one of the strongest pillars of our solidarity art form museum has been always the community. Uh, though we receive even pushbacks uh, till day, even today, 
but it it has always been community right from day one i think we pitched in a model where we were very clear about uh, a mu art farm live art farm museum where community takes care of it rather than we taking care of it um so i think all in all involving people is the key uh, i think that helps yeah i agree with sabod it's it's been the same for us um it's very participatory and and i think the key is ownership so um as nitin mentioned this space is actually um the women have complete ownership of the space they have the keys they know it's their space even the artwork it wasn't ever directed by us that this is what it should look like or this is what you need to make it was about how do you want to express yourself and there was no right or wrong and i think for everything it's a collective decision even the pop ups it's it's a collective decision what what do we want to do where should we go so i think the we is really key here um and an ownership yeah okay thank you so the challenge is that there are quite a few really good questions in the q and a uh, so i'll try to find a way to uh, maybe collect them all and share them with the speakers via email uh, and and you can see uh, if if you can uh, answer them. I think there's a couple more per person. So uh, what I'd like to do because we're reaching kind of the the end of our of our uh, session of our what if session. I was thinking it'd be great if if you could each again kind of speak about uh, your perception of craft and and your involvement with it uh, because you know we've been able to see these different kind of takes on uh, you know craft as a means to establish an identity or kind of uh, you know discuss an identity, uh, discuss power dynamics, um, you know, and, and there are different timescales, different uh, degrees of agency. So there are a lot of things to, to, to kind of pick apart here. Uh, so if uh, if you wouldn't mind kind of sharing with us, you know, take two, three minutes each to uh, share your thoughts on it, what are kind of defining aspects of, uh, of uh, the practice of crafts that you kind of relate to and, and whether or not, you know, uh, you feel like you're Part of this momentum of, of the idea of a future uh, of craft. So, uh, Sahij, if you'd like to go first, and maybe we'll work our way back up to the speaker list. Uh, so, um, so, like with craft, like uh, for me, it's like um, like there's these two kind of like sort of axes that um, like the entire thing. I mean, how I sort of look at even making, you know. Uh, is like, um, in fact, even you could think about this like mythological kind of narrative at large, and then like each piece as a uh, bricolage. Okay, so like bricolage being, uh, you know, essentially like collage or whatever, but then uh, you don't really know the larger kind of shape that it's going to take. So, kind of like, I mean, I'm not conscious of the fact that I'm doing this or whatever, uh, but essentially, um, you end up kind of creating uh processes or whatever to make uh these objects right for example uh so i also do performances and uh in the performances now i make like musical instruments that kind of get used by performers my, myself sometimes um as part of the whole thing now uh so they'll be like you know say for example didgeridoos that are made out of like bin, bin out of pvc pipes you know so your uh bathroom pipes for example like you know uh so uh now what happens here is like i don't know how to play a didgeridoo but i try to figure out like how that works uh or like you know there was like another thing where uh so i found a sitar right uh and uh the gourd the the kind of like drum of the sitar was broken okay so now to kind of like complete the drum uh what i did was like i made a mask out of it essentially so what you're doing is like you're putting it on your head and you go kind of the, the the like you know i mean if there's uh any classical musician say this thing i'm going to get a lot of hate but essentially you're wearing the sitar and then you're playing it like that like, you know with the kind of snout of the creature or whatever being the thing where the strings are how do you play this thing right like you know so you kind of like not only does it like here what happens is essentially like you kind of restructure the entire thing of like you know making and then kind of trying to figure out okay what have you been you know uh so that's that's one uh and then like with uh 
there's this like you know another thing that i'm kind of interested in as far as like making is concerned and this is something that like you know i mean you see it in politics uh, so the the process or whatever is called detournement so essentially detournement in like say chess or in uh, any kind of game or uh, politics or whatever is uh, <laughs> um, you change the the kind of rules of the game itself okay rather than playing a game like playing by the rules or whatever uh, or like you know playing a move the moves that you play change the entire the landscape of the uh, the board or the 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 field of play or whatever entirely like you know so uh, and this is the tournament so it's almost like you know you're kind of doing these knights moves but uh, like each time you make a move the uh, like the you're not playing the same game anymore you're playing like you know it's cheats like uh, i feel like this is essentially what's happening with uh, with ai right now especially if you think about like you know with artificial intelligence and craft because you have this like non human form that's actively capable of producing knowledge right in a very kind of utilitarian way it's capable of producing information uh of producing this new kind of thing that that like you know before this didn't exist uh and when you're creating ai programs that kind of do this uh they are uh, you're essentially kind of letting these things out loose into the world right like you're kind of um an ai program that creates art is like you know you're not creating the artwork itself but you're creating an entity that kind of creates the artwork so here again like even the the kind of like bounds of like say um sculpture making kind of changes right like you know because you have this like non human collaborator uh, that is kind of engaging in the tournament with you rather than you know you just kind of like creating over like the whole idea of like bath kind of roland bath kind of talks about the death of the author right like here uh it, you know it's kind of like the death of the author on steroids so sort of. uh, <laughs> um i don't know uh so yeah yeah like you know i'm kind of interested in that like you know you kind of like uh seeding ground in a way to uh let uh the non human kind of like intelligence is kind of like take take your uh yeah uh give shape to like narrative and things like that uh okay, yeah okay. sorry if that's too round about huh. <laughs> So, so well, if if we could have your take also on you know how uh, your practice and and the way you engage with communities and and what you do uh, informs your take on on craft. Uh. Yeah. Uh, so especially talking about on ground uh, work that we are currently doing, the kind of uh, experiences that we gather on a daily basis. Uh, i think how i look at art especially also working with uh, children who are first generation learners um uh, we don't restrict arts to just problem solving for me arts is all about the hope that ge it generates within the community uh, we look at arts mostly on a broader scale the whole design and the whole concept of learning as uh, the hope it generates within the uh, community uh, the problems that still exist but instead of you know we just being talking about the problems and uh, uh trying to uh, just address the problems i think that that's not the primary goal but also uh, in the process uh, the way kids engage with the problem the way kids uh, build up their own ideas build up their own philosophies and theories uh for me arts is all about that arts is all about that medium where kids find their own identity especially uh with the conventional education system that we have all been brought up with uh which kinds of uh, restricts human diversity to you know mere certain subjects and certain ways of teaching and learning um i think arts and craft especially helps us break that myth uh break that uh, stereotype of education current day education so yeah all in all like these are three to four takeaways one is like it gives hope it helps child build their own philosophies and their own give shape to their ideas i think that's a big one with arts and craft uh, especially with the children um and third not just talking about problems and not just talking about what's wrong and all the things that are missing in the puzzle piece rather talking about what can we actually do about it what can, how can we actually actively engage with it uh for us arts is about that okay thank you very much
So Sumedan, Nitin, I'll let you um, share your views. Um, may, uh, okay, all right, maybe I start. Um, uh, I think for, for, for me, for me um, and maybe for us, Sumedan, tell, tell if you agree with this. Um, I think uh, we need to understand the origin of arts and crafts, the word crafts as well, no? in, in, in the Indian context. And uh, it actually is related a lot in very uh, peculiar way to the independence movement and to Gandhi's Satyagraha. And actually he was reading uh, Philip Morris's book on arts and crafts in South Africa. And he got inspired to actually um, remove India from this empire of cotton that was building in the world um through spinning his own cloth um through crafts through mm -hmm. empowering people through crafts through um having these 700,000 villages as autonomous utopias in india and building another vision for india through crafts now what's presented to us now is a very different reality right so i think for for us for me especially the learning from engaging with people um in in a place that has garment manufacturing and yet is deindustrializing in a very uh, contradictory way um is that craft becomes a democratic uh, critical tool no so you reflect critically on your surroundings and you try to bring out latencies and you try to empower latencies through craft so for me that's been a learning through this process that i've gone through with Nida. Yeah, I just want to add to what Nitin was saying. I feel um, one of the things about craft is we always like related to there's a community that creates a certain kind of craft. And I feel yeah. like I after this process, I've seen it in the reverse. I feel like craft in the future will create community. You know, the act of coming together and making something. Um, it, it it's also a way of creating an identity um and that those are two things that i saw in this process was that it created a community it created an identity and it really became a carrier or a tool or a vessel for empowerment but also for carrying a voice and and here craft becomes the tool and and i think i'm quite amazed at how craft can do so much more than just be um an object or a product or um but it's it it, it almost becomes a space or a platform in this case yeah well Thank you so very much. Uh, this has been incredibly insightful. Um, and, you know, being able to, to hear these, I mean, you know, there's always, uh, I've shared the way we had kind of intended the framing of this discussion and, and these kind of uh, pillars around, you know, problem solving and, and that diversifying the voices uh, and experimenting with mediums with also being able to hear, you know, hearing it from a different perspective as, as crafts being a, a tool to kind of seed and help grow uh, communities. Uh, or as a way to kind of complement, if not kind of subvert education, you know. Um, and, and I think also this idea of uh, kind of celebrating craft as a, as a kind of shapeless process sometimes and, and letting it take you where it wants to go, uh, especially as someone who practices it, right. Um, it, it's, it's often too easy to kind of think of it just from the tra uh, traditional lens uh, because of the way we interact with museums and it's kind of put it in its own silo. Um, and, and so it's really nice for me at least to, to be reminded that uh, it's just one kind of snapshot of a, of a vector, you know, of a kind of a practice and, and artifacts that, that kind of carry through time. Um, so it's been really kind of incredible to, to, to hear your perspectives on this uh, and, and uh, uh, get to see your work. Um, again, a couple of things before we close, uh, I'll do my best to kind of get these questions. A few more have come through again. so. Uh, I'll get those, email them to you, uh, try to get in touch with the, the kind of attendees who've uh, asked them. Um, and for everyone who is still here, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of, uh, starting a performance at 6.30 on our uh, Insta uh, Unbox Festival Instagram. So uh, this is by Kursorama, who uh, creates these kind of generative and algorithmic visuals. 
um, over a music by Kilgan, a, a band that we met, uh, a duo, a musical duo who we met through uh, some of our kind of uh, musical residencies at Unbox. Uh, and so, uh, for anyone who wants to uh, tune in, I'll just leave the uh, Instagram handle at the bottom here. Uh, on bar. Oh, here we go. Um, and so, yeah, I, I invite everyone to kind of tune in, come see. Uh, please uh, reach out to us. You have the contact of the different speakers as well uh, to kind of get in touch. Uh, and, and thank you so much uh, again. You know, I'm, I'm just very happy to, to have been able to be part of this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.